Um, we're going to continue uh, this morning uh, what uh, was extremely fruitful um, and uh, what I thought was a very successful day yesterday. We received a lot of comments about the, um, the uniqueness of the approach of having the interaction between uh, real scientists and real clinicians. Um, and um, um, I, uh, I think that that serves as a great uh, foundation for um, setting up some great research collaborations and, and, um, and some, some more uh, follow-up of these symposiums. So yesterday we ha heard a lot about the different models. Uh, we heard about risk factors. Uh, we heard about pathophysiology, both from a clinical perspective as well as from the scientific perspective. And this morning we're going to move forward with some treatment approaches uh, from the two sides. The first speaker this morning is, uh, is an old friend, uh, Luca Rizzetti, Rizzetti from the University of Milan. He's the director of the Eye Clinic University of Milan in, 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 um, in, in San Paolo Hospital. Um, and he will be uh, speaking about the effect of um, high-intensity focused ultrasound cyclocoagulation in decreasing IOP and refractory glaucoma. Uh, Luca, it's all yours. So thank you, uh, Alan. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I will speak about the effect of uh, HIFU cyclocoagulation in refractory glaucoma. Um, I don't know how many ophthalmologists are here, but uh, usually when we speak about uh, cyclophotocoagulation, we speak about something that is considered a sort of the last shore for glaucoma patients. After patients have failed all traditional medical and uh, surgical treatments, then what we do lastly is we, we treat with laser uh, with this uh, cyclophotocoagulation. The problem of this type of treatment is that uh, we can see a lot of complications, a lot of complications that are site threatening. Uh, you see, the, these are, this slide is, is summarizing a number of papers using different techniques to do cyclophotocoagulation. And you, and you can see that the success rate is quite variable throughout the papers, ranging from 40 to, to 90 percent. But if you look at this, the complication of this type of treatment, you can have a vision loss in 60% of cases and very bad complication like bulbar phthisis in up to 7% of cases. So it means that this patient will lose completely their, not only vision, but also their eye. Using high intensity focus ultrasound is not a new thing in, in medicine. There are different areas like uh, especially cancer areas that have been tried with this type of treatment. And uh, actually thousands of patients have been treated throughout the world with uh, this type of technique. The idea is uh, uh, just like what we do with, with a lens and the sun, and we try to concentrate a high level of energy in a very small volume. And uh, this is done in order to obtain a significant heat effect, a thermal effect, but it, it is that is focused on a small point in order to precisely treat a particular area we want to treat. So which parameters we have? We have power, electric power uh, transformed in, in vibration. Then we have frequency and we have time of exposure. What we observe when we apply HIFU effect on a biological tissue, we see a very important effect only in a small area which is surrounded by completely normal, untreated areas of tissue. What we want to do, we want to concentrate on uh, a small area of the ciliary body that's producing the aqueous humor in order to destroy through the uh, thermic thermal effect on that particular area in order to reduce 
the aqueous uh, production. This uh, uh, tool uses a ring-shaped device that allows for treatment at the same time of six different points of the ciliary body, just in one step. The, de the device is very simple. This is very important in order to do something that can be easily standardized. We want something very easy to perform. We have a, a transducer, which is uh, uh, cylindrical, that can treat not a focal point, but a segment, which is a, large, a little larger area of the ciliary body to produce the thermal effect. There is a, a very uh, easy technique using a suction ring that allows for centration of the device, and we can very easily understand whether the, 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 the ring and the, and the probe is uh, centered looking at the sclera around, around the probe, and we can assess if it is fitting in the right position. Of course, we have different size of the eye, so we have different probes. We have three, at the moment, uh, there are available three different size of, of the probe, 1.7, 12.2, 2, and 12.7 12 millimeters probes. And this is a very simple control module. We just press a pedal and we look that in a few seconds the machine is working at the three, at the th six different uh, areas of uh, the ciliary body. So there are uh, uh, this this uh, this device has been around for some years, and we have some clinical trials already published. And um, uh, w what is relevant to me here is that, despite the fact that very different types of glaucoma, uh, when we when we try new devices, um, we try that on different patients, particularly in patients that have done different types of surgeries that are very V variable pressure, very uh, variable uh, history of glaucoma. And it is very unusual to find consistent results. But despite this, all the publication and the, and the, the case series I'm going to show you in a minute are providing quite consistent results. And if you look at the, the relative IUP reduction in terms of percentage, about 30% IUP reduction than baseline could be observed in, in this study. But what, what, what's more interesting is the safety of the tool. In fact, no major complication. Remember the first slide I showed you with the complication of the cyclodestructive procedure using laser, a lot of uh, site threatening complications. With this kind of tool, um, we did not observe any significant complication. The only complication we observed, and uh, it has also been published in literature, is um, ocular apremia. Ocular apremia without observing any particular anterior chamber reaction, inflammatory reaction, which is very typical of the uh, cyclodestructive procedure. And I'm going to show you, we were part of an investigation plan, multi-center, international, and uh, we at San Paolo Hospital, we did uh, 13 cases. We did many more, uh, more recently, but uh, I'm going pr to present you just uh, the, the patients that were part of this investigation plan. These were patients that had already had at least one a surgery of the eye, trabeculectomy, or even more than one, but at least one. And in fact, we have a very bad uh, cases, case series, uh, seven with at least one trabeculectomy, three already undergone cytochrome photocoagulation with laser, two with the drainage implants, three with keratoplasty, and so on. So very bad, uh, very bad cases, very uh, representative of what we call refractory glaucoma. All the patients were under medical, maximal uh, medical tolerated treatment with systemic acetazolamide 
for head corneal edema. We treated with peribulb anesthesia, six zones with two minutes duration and one single procedure. Preoperative intraocular pressure was about 28 millimeters of mercury. In the first months, IUP on average went down of 37%. And uh, in one year, one year results, the pressure was 30%, again, about 30% less than baseline. And this reduction uh, does not include the interruption of overall carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. As I was saying before, safety, I think, is, is the main issue. And uh, we just observed a mild hyperemia that could last for some, for some months, but uh, uh, no, no other relevant side effects could be, could be observed. And this is a, a patient case. That was my first, my first uh, patient. Um, she had uh, been operated with uh, of, of cataract surgery in two surgeries, so probably some important complications were referred to our clinic with elevated IOP. And I performed a baculectomy in uh, 2011 with mitomycin C. For one year, the pressure was completely controlled. This is her visual field. The pressure was okay for one year, but then uh, IOP uh, increased again above 35 millimeters of mercury, corneal edema, and despite medical treatment, maximal tolerated medical therapy. So we performed a high few uh, cycle of treatment, and uh, after we have uh, now more than one year, 0.5 follow up, also close to two years now and intraocular pressure with just one drop is completely controlled and no significant side effect. This is another more recent study that compared two different type of treatments, two different duration of uh, treatment for each particular area of the ciliary body. And I don't want to go into details, but again, uh, the, the reduction in terms of percentage are very consistent and about 30% of reduction than baseline. And uh, ocular complications, again, very few, only uh, about 10% of visual acuity of more than two lines in 10% of patients. How does this procedure work? Probably, we don't know uh, perfectly, but probably there is a double effect. Of course, the destruction of the ciliary body with the shrinkage that had been observed, so uh, reduction of aqueous humor production. On the other hand, the, an effect on sclerociliary body junction with a retraction of the tissue that will open the uvascular pathway and increasing so the outflow. And these are some nice images to show you. These are treated area and treated area. You see the, the different, now with bigger magnification, you see the untreated area and the treated area with the absence of ciliary epithelial cells, but the barrier is still present. And this is another good image showing the tissue retraction and the space you see indicated by, by the arrows with the enlarged uvoscleral pathway. It must be also some ciliary body detachment there with a decrease of intraocular pressure, but still the this is could be one of the uh, mechanisms involved. So the advantages of this procedure, I think it's quite interesting because it's very known in this, it's very, it's very safe, it's very standardized. It, it is not operator dependent, it's fast, very fast. The profile is very, very uh, low risk, it's efficient, it's probably durable, what is the problem in, of this procedure now to me? It is that in some patients we do not see any effect at all. You, we, the, 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 this is really evident just after one week to one month from treatment. This is because probably we don't destroy enough ciliary body because we cannot 
treat exactly where the ciliary body is. So we, we judge, sh choosing the right size probe, what will be the position we think will be the position of the ciliary body. Probably in some cases this is not true because of the different position of the ciliary body and so we probably do not treat the ciliary body, we don't treat it exactly how we would like. And so in these patients we don't see any effect. We don't see no complication at all for sure, but we don't see any significant effect. But still, an average IUP reduction of 30% in baseline, I think for this kind of patient, it's something that as a clinician, I think they're very valuable. Thanks for the attention. I will have a short quick question at the beginning because so far I know Dr. Luca Rossetti will probably leave us and will not stay for the panel discussion. So my question is, uh, we know, all know that cyclophotocoagulation might not only cause post-operative pain, but it's a painful procedure itself. So what about your high food procedure? Is it painful? And also related question about retreatment. Have you seen in your patients that retreatment would be needed or you are successful after a single procedure? Well, uh, in terms of pain, uh, we, we do uh, peribulbar anesthesia. If you do peribulbar anesthesia, then the patient is okay. Someone tried with uh, topical anesthesia, but I don't think it's possible. In, in, this, in this case, it can be painful but it's not painful at all as compared with the, with the, laser, with the laser procedure. Uh, in terms of retreatment, uh, well, yes, I have some cases where we retreat exactly the same areas because the, the, the treatment was effective at the beginning, and then after one year, it lost completely the effect, so we decided to retreat the patients. And I think in, in at least 50% of cases, we had some interesting results. Do you know where you are, uh, that you are treating the same, uh, the same side, the same processes? Do you have some specif uh, specific marker where you are, that you are again in the same process, or you just have the feeling? Well, the, the, the position of the ring has to be the same, because you have to keep one point where, where there is a small tube, you have to keep that position in, in that particular uh, position. So you, you, can, you can be quite precise in retreating because once you put the ring in the same position then the, the six areas are automatically chosen the same way. So we think that more or less, we, we, we cannot be precise at all, but we think that more or less the area will be, will be the same. And uh, I think it, it's okay because if the pressure is going up again, that means that the ciliary body started to work again. So you, it's, it's right you retreat something that you treated before ineffectively. This is a well-known problem. That's the position of the, uh, of the choroid. Uh, ciliary body is variable compared to the limbus. When we do this, we do diaphanoscopy, so you do a translucent of the eye to see where it is. Uh, but that can be hard with the ring. There's another way of doing it, like Jackson Coleman did when he treated uh, uh, ocular melanomas, choroidal melanomas. He had a high-focused also sound transducer, and he had another uh, conventional transducer to see where actually he was treating. Maybe you could fit it in on the sites uh, at six and nine o'clock, one, uh, one of the sites with a UBM oh, sure. device or something like that. That's a very nice idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions for Luca? Excellent. Thank you very much. Very, very Thank much. You. Thank you. Okay, uh, as uh, we continue in the way of new treatments and, um, and new modalities, um, we're going to uh, move to our next speaker. Where's Michelle? I'm here. Uh, there you are, Michelle. Okay. <laughs> Another good friend of mine, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Michelle uh, Janicott from uh, um, Isarna. And uh, Michelle is going to tell us today about the um, use of TGF beta, transforming growth factor beta, in uh, advanced glaucoma. Uh, talk about a um,
preclinical perspective and um, really engage us into a discussion uh, of where the possible role of these uh, new compounds in glaucoma. Michel. Thank you very much. Uh, buongiorno a tutti. Uh, unfortunately, I have exhausted all my knowledge of uh, Italian language, so I will continue in English if you don't mind. Uh, I want also to thank the organizer to give us the opportunity to present some of our uh, data, very encouraging data. Um, initially, when I looked at the program, I felt a little bit like uh, being an uh, outlier in this uh, community and in this uh, presentation, but hearing again and again uh, meeting organizer and Alan presenting the concept of this conference, which is to bring all the different disciplines uh, working together, talking together, trying to understand each other, and to one goal is to have a better understanding of the disease, because it's the only way for us as a scientist, as a clinical researcher, engineer, mathematician, statistician, uh, to really, really understand better what we are fighting for and to be able to bring uh, new novel, better drugs to the patient. Because at the end of our journey, like we heard uh, just previously, patients are at the other end waiting for us to come up with a better solution or more adapted solution. So I'm not going to talk to you about a mathematical model in this presentation. I'm just going to give you some flavor of sort of a classical pharmacology and in vivo pharmacology applied to uh, drug discovery and, uh, and development. So I'm uh, Michel Janico, I'm a consultant working with uh, Isarna Therapeutics, who is a small biotech company uh, based in, uh, in Germany. I didn't uh, prepare a uh, financial disclosure slide, but uh, you know about me now. So, uh, as uh, Alan mentioned in his uh, introduction, what the, the purpose of our research uh, within the, uh, the company is really, really to focus on one particular molecular target that is uh, extremely important in, uh, in human pathophysiology and is involved in many, many uh, human disease. This molecular target or targets are uh, TGA beta, transforming growth factors, which are a family of cytokines which are really, really involved in many, many physiological, biological, cellular uh, aspects of, uh, of disease. Uh, as far as uh, ocular uh, tissues are concerned and ocular disease are concerned, it is known that uh, all the uh, TGF beta uh, isoform and their receptor are indeed present in uh, ocular tissue. If you want to target a molecular target, you better be sure that the target is expressed in your um, uh, um, targeted tissues and, uh, and disease. Uh, and then, you know, as I mentioned, that those cytokines are really, really involved in many, many aspects of, uh, of cell biology and the, uh, the modulation of uh, cell behavior in uh, ocular tissue, as you will see in a minute. Uh, there is a direct involvement of, uh, of TGF beta in the uh, maintaining of the uh, optic nerve, uh, and especially TGF beta is involved in basically degradation of the optic nerve under uh, stress. Uh, TGF beta cytokines are upregulated in case of, uh, of stress, especially in case of wound healing, initiating a very, very complex but very potent program of uh, fibrosis and cell, uh, cell migration. There was an obvious uh, focus on one particular cytokine, which was TGF beta 2 uh, uh, cytokine and not TGA beta 1 and not TGA beta 3, and there are gallons of publication indicating the major role of TGA beta 2 in uh, inocular uh, disease. So our question was how to really, really efficiently and specifically target TGA beta 2. As you know, there are and there have been attempt to use uh, specific antibodies against a different uh, isoform, 
those um, uh, agents have not been fully successful in the uh, ocular disease, and I, I will talk to you a little bit about this in a minute. So our approach was to use another tool to really, really achieve specific down regulation of our particular molecular target, and we have used antisense uh, oligonucleotide. So those tools are quite old. Uh, however, in the last uh, decade, there have been some development in the chemistry of those oligonucleotides and some modification of the uh, chemistry of the backbone of the, uh, the antisense, which have really, really strongly improved the drug-like properties of those drugs. So here you have the, the molecule that we are going to, to talk about and that I'm going to focus on, which is a uh, 14-mer uh, oligonucleotide with some chemical modification at both ends to improve the drug-like properties. As a sort of a, a general aspect of this kind of, uh, of molecule that we uh, are uh, selecting those uh, agents to be potent and selective, and here our agent is really, really potent and selective on TGF beta 2, uh, uh, leading to uh, very rapid and efficient degradation, specific degradation of the TGF beta 2 uh, mRNA. This has been done not only in cell based assay, but also in, uh, in vivo. And as part of our ophthalmology program, we are focusing on intraocular administration and particularly intravitreal administration, which consists of injecting the agent directly in the back of the eye in the vitreous uh, humor. What we have seen because of this procedure, as you can imagine, you cannot really, really give this kind of intervention every day. Uh, so uh, you have to be able to administer the drug in a very, very infrequent manner. What we have seen is that after single administration of the drug in the vitreous humor, there is a very, very rapid clearance of the drug from the vitreous humor, which initially really, really scared us uh, like hell because then we were uh, talking about injection every two days, every three days, but luckily looking at the distribution of the drug in posterior eye tissue, we've seen that there is a massive and really, really long-lasting tissue distribution of the drug in the uh, retina, in the um, choroid, in uh, different uh, other um, posterior eye tissues with evidence of target unregulation effect on the uh, antisense for up to two months after a single administration. And then we breathed a little bit uh, easier at that time when we've got this, uh, this result. Uh, our aim, and you will see later in the, in the presentation, was to target the glaucoma because of the uh, demonstrated importance and involvement of TGA beta and TGA beta 2 in the, uh, in the disease. And to test this hypothesis, what we have used is a model in the mouse, which is a glaucoma filtration model that sort of mimic the trabeculectomy that is being performed in the, uh, in the clinic, except that here we do not have glaucomatous mice, but we are doing an incision in the eye of the mice with a, uh, an, a needle creating a sort of drainage canal uh, and then we create a flap and, uh, in, the, in the bleb area and then very, very shortly, about after two weeks, then the bleb is failing, which means that the, due to a very, very active wound healing, the canal is getting clogged again and then the liquid doesn't flow uh, anymore and then basically you have to re-operate the mice. Here in that case, the mice are, are not diseased, so basically you have uh, two weeks to, uh, to intervene. What you can do also in that particular model, not only looking at the bleb area, the bleb size, but also the bleb survival, you can look at things like uh, inflammation, 
blood vessels, and obviously fibrosis, which is for us really, really key biomarkers of activity of uh, our drug. So what we've done is that uh, we have used a series of mice with this uh, procedure, and what we have performed is a, a single intravitreal uh, administration here, and when you inject saline or a totally irrelevant antisense oligonucleotide, as you have seen in the previous slides, you rapidly see a, uh, a bleb failure with the, the bleb size decreasing, and after about two weeks, then all the blebs have, uh, have failed. After injection of uh, our uh, antisense, what we see is, first of all, a higher bleb size, but also a sort of delay in the BLEPS closure, which is statistically significant. This was done after intravitreal administration, but we have done also with intracameral administration, and this I can tell you that technically you need to be skilled to inject less than one microliter in the aqueous humor of a mouse uh, eye, but the uh, colleague at uh, uh, Catholic University of, uh, of Leuven, with whom we've uh, collaborated, have been able to, to do that. And here, under the same condition, with a single administration, also comparing with saline or irrelevant scrambled, which means that the sequence of the oligo is totally screwed and does not recognize any of the uh, human mRNA, that you see that uh, our drug really, really strongly uh, impaired the ability of this lab to, uh, to close, and we have a very, very uh, strong delay in, uh, in lab uh, closure and lab uh, failure. As I mentioned, what we could do also is to uh, look at the uh, fibrosis, and which is very, very important phenomenon involved in the uh, uh, bleb uh, failure. And what we see is that after intravitreal administration or intracameral uh, administration, that with our drug, we see a significant decrease in the extent of fibrosis which, by the way, really, really sort of validate our uh, claim mechanism of action with our drug, which is an uh, antifibrotic uh, effect. Something that is interesting, a little bit complicated on this slide, sorry, it's, uh, it's quite busy, but this is a comparison of uh, our result with some historical data using either mitomycin C or bevacizumab, which is a, uh, an antibody against uh, VEGF. And you see that, you know, the saline and the uh, irrelevant uh, antisense is here, mitomycin and bevacizumab is here, and series of uh, our uh, antisense oligonucleotides uh, are here showing, you know, uh, um, a similar, if not superior, effect of uh, our drug candidate in that particular model. And this was also uh, indicated by the extent of fibrosis, where uh, our uh, oligos show uh, even more decrease in the collagen deposition in the bleb uh, area. So, the take-home message here was uh, our drug candidate, very early drug candidate, uh, as I said, is a very potent and selective TGA beta-2 antisense uh, oligo. We do have uh, demonstrated activity in a pharmacological model of uh, glaucoma, mimicking the uh, trabeculectomy uh, procedure after intraocular administration, and we have some uh, competitive and maybe superior data as compared to some of the benchmark that they're being used. One thing that is quite interesting that I will not have the time to describe here is that in another model of uh, choroidal neovascularization in the mouse, uh, looking at uh, retinopathy, that we do have a very, very uh, intense anti-angiogenic effect which opened the door to potential development of our drug candidate in uh, other uh, retinopathy, like uh, diabetic retinopathy or uh, AMD. 
We obviously have uh, documented the toxicology profile and uh, all the package was uh, showing a, a favorable uh, therapeutic index. Looking at, in more uh, perspective, uh, looking at the expected mechanism of action of our drug vis-a-vis -vis the disease and how we are going to use the drug in the, uh, in the clinic, it is clear that with uh, our uh, antisense, the idea is really, really to prevent the uh, rise of intraocular pressure following uh, trabeculectomy. As you all know, if you are uh, ophthalmologists and clinicians, uh, and surgeon that you do trabeculectomy and after six to nine to 12 months, then basically the, the canal that you've created is uh, clogging again and then you see an increase in uh, intraocular pressure. Another important element here is the neuroprotective effect on the optic nerve because as I told you, TGF beta 2 is involved in neurodegeneration. So if you block TGF beta 2, then you should maintain the optic nerve, which is very, very important because most of our patients do not get blind because of increase of IOP, but because of the degeneration of the optic nerve and uh, um, activity on the uh, optic nerve. And with the anti-scarring effect and antifibrotic effect, we hope to achieve really, really three different uh, targets uh, in the eye, really, really validating the intraocular and the intravitreal administration, because if you want to access the optic nerve, you definitely need to inject the drug uh, there, and then you create a, uh, a massive uh, effect that we hope to see in the, in the clinic. As I say in the introduction, that patients are at the other end of our journey as a scientist, and here is, I think, a, a good example, is that with this program, we've been able to, uh, to move into clinical trial, and we have at the moment uh, our drug being tested in, uh, in uh, glaucoma, patient undergoing uh, trabeculectomy. And uh, to do that, you're never alone. And this work has been done in collaboration and a very, very good collaboration with the group of uh, Ingeborg Stalmans and Liva Munz at the uh, Catholic University of, uh, of Leuven, and obviously in collaboration with my colleagues at uh, Izarna. And I thank you very much for your attention. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, please. How, uh, when you're saying that you're using it during the surgery, you're using it during trabeculectomy, how is it, uh, what is the dosage or something? So uh, right now it's a classical phase one dose escalation, so we are uh, escalating the dose based on the tox uh, study that we, uh, we have done in the, uh, in the rabbit and we are continuing also in the uh, Cynomolgus uh, monkey. We are in the first part of our phase one, we are doing a single administration at the time of surgery with increasing uh, dose, of course, and we are uh, at the moment about at the uh, middle of our uh, phase one, so we have uh, already uh, escalated uh, once, uh, and we are planning to escalate uh, two times uh, again in the next uh, cohort. And, oh, sorry, go ahead. So is it ap applied subconjunctively like the mitomycin C or is there any other method of uh, the, the, It's not co-medication, so it's being used uh, at the time of, uh, of trabeculectomy and if the patient are undergoing other uh, kind of, uh, of treatment uh, post uh, trabeculectomy, they can. But uh, the, the, the drug is being just injected at the time of the uh, So of where the is surgery. it injected is my question. Is it injected subconjunctively? No, no, intravitreal. Intravitreal. Yes, in the vitreous body. Oh, thank you very much for this very nice talk. Do you have, uh, the, you didn't show, but I think that you have uh, some, let's say, models about, models I mean, mm, biomolecular models of the signaling pathways that are uh, yes. elicited in yes. all of this. And do you have a, 
do, do we have a precise ideas about that? So basically, you know, we are insisting on the uh, fibrotic, on the anti-angiogenic effect, potentially inflammation. The problem that we are having, but here the we mean scientists and uh, preclinical scientists, is that the preclinical models are not very, very relevant for the clinical situation. This is probably not something new that you've never heard before. Uh, for instance, uh, after the glaucoma filtration surgery, you have a two weeks window before the bleb is failing. In the human situation, this will take six to nine to 12 months. Therefore, all of these mechanisms are sort of a hyper-accelerated and hyper-active, which means that they are quite challenging for a drug to be active, and especially a drug that is not a cytotoxic or a uh, beta-adrenergic receptor antagonist or things like that. So when you are talking about a, a drug that is going to modulate the cellular mechanism and cellular behavior, this is quite uh, challenging. So we are looking at physical readouts, the uh, bleb size, fibrosis, angiogenesis, and uh, inflammation. And of course, we are doing also some more uh, molecular biology on the TGF-beta signaling pathway, TGF-beta itself, and downstream signaling pathway in the target organs. Thank you so much. Yes, please, Luca. If you inject this into the vitreous, it means that it has to reach high, high enough concentration to work on the external side of the eye, between the conjunctiva and the sclera. So how, which kind of complication are you, are you expecting in the local or in the interior segment, for instance? So uh, luckily what we have seen so far is that the toxicity of this kind of agent is quite mild, if very, very uh, limited. What we see is sign of uh, lens opacification, uh, uh, probably linked also to the uh, oligonucleotide background, uh, backbone which has been described in the, uh, in the literature. But actually what we have seen, at least in the, uh, in the rabbit, and we are doing similar studies in the monkey, that we have really, really massive tissue distribution, including in the ciliary body and in the trabecular meshwork uh, area. So we really, really hope that uh, you well tolerated those that we should have uh, enough uh, drug concentration and, uh, and activity. I would like to have one more comment. I think for those who are not familiar with this topic, with that absolutely new approach, should probably face British Journal of Ophthalmology because they have a very nice review on TGF beta. So it's really coming and we are really interested in that. Thank you very much. And I still have one more question, very short, because I think you are fighting against fibrosis and against scarring. So have you faced the opposite problem, that the wound leakage is happening, or the wound is not closing at all, and you have no blab formation? Uh, we, we have not. Uh, we are <laughs> very, very careful about that, and it's a possibility, but so far we haven't seen that. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, our next speaker. Uh, which will be uh, Peter Koch Jensen from uh, from Denmark, and uh, Peter has been a very active physician scientist over the years. Um, and Peter uh, is going to talk to us today about mathematical model of hydraulic pressure in uh, intraocular gas bubbles. He is our representative from the Scandinavian region. Thank you very much, Alan, and, and thank you. Friend. I'm most grateful for this invitation to this beautiful capital of culture, of fashion and technology. This is really exciting to be here, and this conference is just what I've been hoping for for the past 10 years. So thank you very much. Here are my disclosures. Most retinal surgeons tell the patients, don't you ever fly with gas in your eye. But not always so definitely 
manifest no go, and I'll tell you why. Many years ago, I operated a patient, and he told me a story that's really haunted my dreams for several years and uh, made me do a pound of careful thought and an ounce of programming to come up with this model. And here's the story he told me. This was on, it's a Danish principal that was on vacation in New Zealand, and he had a retinal rupture, and he was treated over there with laser pexy around the tear, and they have given gas in the eye. And normally the gas takes about six weeks to be reabsorbed. But he couldn't wait, he had to go home. And he was allowed to fly out of there, but unfortunately the eye was painful and he lost vision during the ascent. Fortunately it recovered over in Sydney and the ophthalmologist gave him some anti-glaucoma drugs and he flew on. And the same thing happens on route to Bangkok and Copenhagen. The vision loss occurred in his eye, but it's uh, restored in flight. F finally, after coming to Copenhagen and I operated him for his retinal detachment, then he regained perfect central vision. So he was a very lucky one because not, this is not always the case. See what happens when you have a gas bubble inside the eye to close the hole? is that we have a pressure inside the bubble or we have the pressure outside the bubble. And the difference is what we call the transcellular pressure or normally we just call it intraocular pressure. This is like when you measure atmospheric pressure in eta or ato. So the difference is what is actually needed here, PT we call it, because it varies in time and this is a transcellular pressure. When you take off with the plane, the pressure goes down on the outside, and that increases the translateral pressure, so the eye expands, uh, and so the, the gas expands to decrease the inside pressure, and in the long run, aqueous is filtered out, and then PT normalizes again at the expansion, at the cost of expansion of the gas bubble. So, can we model that? Sure, we can. We have some equation describing all the processes. We have a small time step here. And we have the translateral pressure changes. This is a change in the inside pressure given by Boyle's law and in differential form. And the outside pressure is a linear function of time in most airplanes. So we can model that very easily. The change in the gas volume has to be balanced by the change in the eye and the aqueous outflow. So the change in the eye is given by the Friedenwald equation, very well known, and the change in the aqueous is this filtration equation. And let's take a look at that. We have the facility of inflow, we have this facility of outflow. This is all classical, old-fashioned physiology. And we have the balance here, we have the aqueous balance. There are some names we have to put on, like Gallen, who proposed secretion, and Barani, who discovered there was a, the screen line for the inflow facility. It was not constant with the pressure. And uh, there's a turning point around the capillary pressure, and Brubaker determined the outflow, many did that, but he had the good equation, and the equilibrium pressure is what we call the IOP, was measured about a thousand years ago by an Arabian doctor, and the uveal outflow is discovered by Alm, and then we have the epistolar vein pressure by Weigel and did some studies. So now we have all the shoulders we stand on when we discuss it. The problem is, can we solve all those equations? Sure, we do back substitution. Here you can see we just go all the way back where we came from, and we have this beautiful equation here with the independent variable all over the place, and some of the parameters or other variables are not constant in time, so we have to resort to numerical integration, as we heard yesterday. Very simple, you do it in Excel, can be done. In old times, we had to use a mainframe, but now the Laptops are so powerful, so we can do it easily. We have these four gradients, and we have the parameters, we have the time step, we have the outflow, uh, out, uh, the, the outside pressure, and we have the inside, the translateral pressure here. And in the next time step, it's given by these four gradients, and then we do this repetitively again. So we come up with a curve. And I did some model tests on experiments performed by Linkoff on three rabbits that were anesthetized and he had a cannula in each eye and he did a rabbit decompression in a few minutes. The rabbits were ex 
experiencing a rapid decompression. And he measured the pressures in the gas-filled eye and in the control eye. And you can see in the control eye, the pressure equilibrates right away because there's no gas. The more gas you have in the lower rabbits, the slower it equilibrates. So I digitized these uh, curves and I calculate least squares between the model and the curves. And then I could calculate the outflow resistance and the ocular distensibility by uh, iteration and came up with some very nice fitting curves. And here you have the calculated variables and the variances, the residual variances. So now let's look what happens. This is a typical plane profile that will happen this afternoon when I fly back to Copenhagen in two hour flight. The pressure decreases about 200 millimeters of mercury during 20 minutes and it stays there until you go down again where the reverse happens. What happens with the translateral pressure? It goes up tremendously. Here we have one milliliter of gas in the model and see the pressure goes up to 75 millimeters of mercury. Without regulation, it would have gone even higher and we can see here on the curves, the blue curve shows the distension of the eye and the red curves, the uh, aqueous outflow of aqueous. And initially you can see that it's the distension of the eye that does the job and later on we see that is the aqueous outflow that's important. There are three parameters of interest. This is the maximum pressure, this is the parameter I call the pain parameter. And then there is a, the time it's above 50 millimeters of mercury, which they call the risk for blindness parameter permanent. And then we have the third parameter, how long does the pressure stay below 5 millimeters? This is the risk for an expulsive choroidal hemorrhage parameter. Let's look at those three parameters in some simulations. Normally we recommend using uh, in a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor when people have to go with gas in the eye, they need to go home or some other important reason. So you see what the model says here, we give a diamox and we see the pressure on the red curves, it goes down, so take it about an hour before the, the flight. And then it goes up just the same amount as without diamox. It has not very much influence on the on the shape of the curve, but in the long run you see that it stays down for very much longer. So let's now look at what happens with different gas volumes. There's no much different except that the pressure rise is much higher when you have larger gas volumes. And we can see that the time it stays above 50 millimeters is also very much influence. Usually I wouldn't recommend staying up more than 30 minutes above 50 and this would be one milliliter absolutely max. And we can see the time it's below 5 millimeters is very much influenced by the gas volume also. Now another interesting parameter would be here what happens to a glaucoma patient. Now we see the same curve again. So now we have this control situation. Now let's make a glaucoma patient by increasing the outflow resistance by, resistance by a factor of 3 and we see the pressure goes up tremendously. Let's treat the model with a prostaglandin. The pressure goes down on the green curve to somewhat 22 millimeters of mercury, and we can see it's not much better. And let's add in a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. We normalize the pressure, but still we have huge rises of the intraocular pressure. This tr the trick is that we need to minimize the outflow resistance and we can do that by trabelectomy. So it seems like the outflow resistance is very important for this process. And also we can see the effect of ascent. The rate of ascent is very important. We have three curves here simulating 5 millimeters per minute, 10 and 20. This would compose to like if you go up on the stelvia pass you would go about 5 millimeters per minute. And when you take the plane it's 10 and if you do crazy things you can get even higher up or you could dive, that would be even worse. So let's see here again, the same thing. The more gas, the higher the pressure goes, but there's a tremendous effect. If you can go slow, you're much better off. The blue curves are showing that you don't get so high pressure. And again, the time above is the same. The slower you go, the less time you are above, but not as marked difference. And the time you stay is below, same story. So I'll tell you a problem. When I work up in Norway, we sometimes operate patients in Bergen. 
at A, and they need to go to their home back in Gaul, and they need to go across a mountain that's Hardangervita, that is elevated about uh, one kilometer, one two. And how should they drive up there? Here are three profiles they could be driving. The normal traffic goes at 60 kilometers per hour, and if you drive slower, you would probably be better off, or you could do it in stops. Let's see what happens. With the red curve, see if you just drive with the traffic, four millimeters per minute, that would give you a huge rise in the pressure. So we recommend going slower, or even better, making stops along the route and wait until the pain goes down a little bit. This should be doing it nicely. If we look at the parameters that is at play here, we have uh, I have calculated normalized sensitivity coefficients. That is just the differential of the curve normalized. And we have here for the various parameters, see the most, a 10% increase in the gas volume will result in a 7% increase in the maximal pressure. And we can see that it's the gas volume and the height, how high you go, that is most important, followed by the ascent rate and the outflow resistance whereas the secretion rate, the distensibility, and the pressure parameter for the outflow resistance are less important, and the Ewer outflow and epistolar rain pressure is not very important. So, let me tell you a story how we performed. We had a Scotsman that had a residual gas after a recent vitrectomy. His father subsequently in Edinburgh died due to old age, and he wanted to attend the funeral, but he had a very important meeting in Copenhagen, so he asked about some travel options. There was a possibility of taking a flight that was cheap and it was fast. However, the drive through the channel from Copenhagen to Edinburgh takes a long time and the ferry is not much better off. So here we have an ultrasound image of his eye. You see the gas bubble with the shadow behind. So we have to calculate the radius of the eye by triangulation, 14 millimeters sound reasonable, and then we could estimate the height of the gas bubble. And I have made intensive studies of how you can calculate the volumes, and this turns out to be 0.3 mil in this case. So he was given dosolomide and he happily took off with no problems. So sometimes you can really go, but you need what to know how to do it. So when you say you shouldn't travel with gas in an eye, you can do some measures to assure that it will go well. So first of all, you measure the bubble height with ultrasound, and then you calculate the perfusion pressure to see if there's enough pressure to drive. It's against the high intercooler pressure. And you can do some provocation tests. If you have a pressure chamber, you can sit the patient in, or if you don't, you can just use a high-rise elevator like here. You can go up 15 millimeters, of mercury, the pressure will fall. That's pretty enough to create a, a curve. If you bring your tonometer along, you can fit it to the model and see how you yeah, calculate the parameters for this individual eye. And you should, of course, give the patient a warning that can, a retinal embolus can occur, and uh, there's a risk of expulsive choroidal hemorrhage. And then there's a warning in case of, of blowouts, the eye might do the same, but it's a very small risk. And then you give Diamox, not because of the pressure lowering effect, but because it really resets the autoregulation. As you see here, the black curves after dorsalamide, the oxygen tension on the optic nerve is really normal after di uh, this is dorsalamide up to about 15 millimeters of mercury. So the next thing is to bribe the pilot, go slow, and you can do that if you are very good at it. And the advice is you should assume brace position just to increase the perfusion pressure and avoid closure angle glaucoma by the gas. So, having done that, go on. Vi auguro un buon viaggio. Peter, thank you very much for this uh, both very scientific but also very entertaining presentation. Um, some questions for Peter Giovanna. So thank you for your talk and thank you for coming. I would like to ask you, so how uh, did you put in the model the action of the drugs? Uh, like which parameters, for example, in the inflow or in the outflow, which parameters did you change to simulate the action of the different drugs? 
to simulate the outflow uh, of uh, uval outflow, I simulated for the prostaglandin. Uh, and this is arbitrarily chosen just to see what happens. So I increased the uval slurl outflow by a factor two, and so how much the pressure went down to 22. I have no idea of this is true actually, but if you do measurements like this and, and determine the parameter of the eye, you can really, with this model, calculate the parameters at play. The UL outflow might be very difficult to calculate because it's not very sensitive. The model is not very sensitive to changes in the UL outflow. And so with the glaucoma patient, I just increased the outflow uh, resistance by a factor true, and so that the pressure went up to 34 millimeters of mercury. So again, I have no evidence that this is actually true in reality. Thank you very much. And now I would like to invite our next speaker, Emanuele Truco from UK, who will be talking about interpreting retinal imaging and OCT. Thank you, Vash. So good morning. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Manuel Truco from the University of Dundee, and uh, um, one of the previous speakers mentioned being an outlier um, uh, boy, I feel like an outlier. Um, uh, I regret not being here yesterday, um, uh, and, but from the program, so I don't have the benefit of direct observation, but from the program, it looks like I'm the only one who um, has the pleasure of introducing some image processing work related to the retina. So I'm going to talk to you about our um, um, large -ish initiative, um, which is an international set of projects called uh, Vampire, which is a real acronym. We are very proud of it. It's an excellent brand name serving as well. I thought that because it is Halloween, uh, I should show at least one pumpkin because we're talking of vampires as well. Um, it's the only pumpkin of the presentation. Let me begin with uh, uh, telling you that uh, um, I'm not, I'm sorry to disappoint from the title, I'm not really going to talk about much about OCT for reasons of time. Um, uh, I only want to mention one thing, courtesy of a good friend and collaborator of uh, our vampire team, Dr. James Cameron, who works at the Unrowling Clinic, in uh, uh, Neurodegenerative Clinic in, uh, in Edinburgh. And James is a, is a kind of uh, you know, movie freak. He likes going to the cinema um, in his free time. And he pointed out this nice thing. In 1999, there was this film. I don't know. I didn't see it. Um, uh, keep in mind the date, 1999. And it was Catherine Zeta-Jones uh, Zeta interpreting some, some sort of you know, secret agent, whatever it is. And there's one scene, apparently, in which she looks into this very advanced device, uh, which is a biometric device. And surprise, surprise, 1999, there's an OCT image. OK? I mean, the resolution is terrible because it's 1999, so you don't see all the layers you see now. But, and I don't need to draw the ophthalmologist's attention to this, but um, clearly they picked an image from uh, the web. Uh, if you look uh, closely, there is a fantastic lesion here um, uh, in the OCT layer, which makes really unlikely that uh, that secret agent could be a secret agent. It's a fantastic episode. Uh, you know, you've got to be careful. The message is, uh, the next film you shoot, uh, be careful with OCT images. But apart from this, um, uh, so this is the lesion. Apart from this, uh, um, uh, so what is Vampire? Vampire is a cluster of uh, projects um, uh, involving quite a few partners uh, in the UK and, uh, and abroad, uh, Asia, UK, Australia, and so on. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, a very, very brief uh, uh, introduction to some of the things we do. Um, I try to modulate a bit um, uh, our standard introductory presentation towards optic disc and glaucomish uh, uh, things as much as I could. So this is uh, an overview of uh, the main areas uh, we deal with. We develop software and algorithms, and these uh, algorithms uh, are all clinically motivated. We work very closely with uh, a team of doctors, no, not only ophthalmologists. So what we do with this software um, is, uh, um, uh, in order, particularly uh, locations of landmarks, uh, particularly in fundus images, ultra-wide field of view, um, uh, and uh, uh, then a lot of work goes into detection and the quantitation of uh, the retinal vasculature. Uh, so I'll show you some examples. Where are the vessels? Uh, what quantitative parameters you can uh, extract to describe the vasculature? Um, uh, we have a stream of work on the analysis of the corneal nerve fibers uh, as observed uh, in uh, confocal microscopy images. Um, um, we have some work uh, on the 
this is one of my pet projects, to generate the synthetic images uh, of the retina, what doctors have called phantom, probably. Um, um, we use a lot of these results uh, uh, in several projects of retinal biomarkers for um, a variety of conditions. So, for instance, we have a project on uh, retinal uh, biomarkers for dementia at the moment, uh, cardiovascular, uh, genetics, uh, uh, various other things. Um, uh, and a stream of work uh, on lesion detection and quantitation. I'll show you some examples. I want to mention analytics because, particularly in the context of uh, biomarkers, which involve uh, the tens of thousands or more of, of images, uh, um, uh, you, we are going very much into big data, and there is a very interesting, for me as a computer scientist, uh, um, cum engineer, there's a very interesting um, um, interrelation between the development of algorithms, uh, the um, um, availability of increasingly large number of images, uh, population level images, uh, uh, platforms, uh, computational platforms, and so on. Okay. So, this is an example of uh, um, an interface, uh, uh, of the interface uh, of one of our main tools, uh, Vampire, proper Vampire version 3.1, which is the latest we have. And uh, there are other things like this uh, uh, in circulation, not many, but around the world, I would say there are at least three main tools, one in Singapore, one in America, and one is ours, uh, essentially. And what you see here is... Uh, um, uh, one um, of a batch of fundus images which has been loaded into the system, processed uh, automatically with uh, uh, manual intervention, um, uh, so the system uh, establishes automatically the position of the optic disc, the, uh, the macula, uh, you can correct, of course, but the rate of success here is above 95%, so there are few corrections normally for good quality images. Um, so a good part of the vasculature is extracted, classified into uh, artery and veins, and then for retinal biomarkers, a standard uh, set of measurements uh, which is taken involves uh, the so-called zone B around the optic disc, which is here, and you see some uh, veins and arteries segments which have been singled out uh, for measurements. And the kind of measurements which are extracted are in this particular version of the software, some of the classics of retinal biomarkers like with related measurements like the AVR, the central equivalence, uh, uh, tortuosity of the vessels, not only of those small segments, of course, uh, uh, bifurcation angles, and we have uh, work on the fractal dimension um, um, on which there is debate, of course. Uh, um, the retinal vasculature is not a fractal in the sense of Benoit Mandelbrot, clearly, but you can compute uh, a parameter called the fractal dimension, which is inspired uh, to, to fractal theory, by fractal theory, and it turns out that this parameter actually increases for visually more complex uh, um, uh, retinal vasculature, and this parameter is being used, has been used in a number of studies uh, uh, as a potential biomarker for various conditions, for instance, risk of stroke, um, lacuna stroke in Edinburgh, for instance. So in terms of lesions, uh, uh, again, just a couple of examples. Uh, um, on the top, uh, there's uh, just a couple of images illustrating, like an impressionistic message, illustrating um, some of the work we do on uh, confocal microscopy for uh, the uh, nerves in uh, the cornea. So this is the kind of images um, uh, that you get. Uh, apart from the reproduction, which is not perfect, of course, uh, and this is a suggestion of uh, where we go with our software automatically. So the point is uh, you want to um, um, locate uh, the skeletons of uh, the center lines of the main corneal fibers, and then from there compute, uh, in our case, density and tortuosity, um, and then use these uh, uh, as uh, potential biomarkers, indicators for um, um, for uh, uh, the presence of some disease and so on. One thing I should mention is that all the measures of, across the uh, modalities of the images that we work with are also, or can also be used longitudinally and should, in my mind, be used longitudinally, for instance, to monitor the progress, the effect uh, of, uh, of treatments uh, is just one example, but just uh, in population-based studies, uh, the, you know, 
uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with the UK Biobank uh, archive, for instance. That's about half a million people which have been imaged, all sorts of data, uh, a subset of this uh, with uh, retinal images, uh, and these data are available. And when you have that, uh, exciting volume of data, of course, uh, it becomes, uh, um, and people have gone back a number of times, uh, it becomes really exciting to use uh, quantitative tools. So, very briefly, uh, the other example I have here um, uh, is with a slightly different type of images. This is um, from an Optus machine. Uh, Optus is a Scottish uh, company based uh, in Dunferling, which is between Edinburgh and Dundee, um, uh, and they are, they are market leaders in the world for ultra-wide uh, field of view um, scanning laser ophthalmoscopes. So this is an image in fluorescent angiographic mode, um, uh, a, one of a sequence. The exam is a sequence uh, of, uh, of images, and we worked a little bit with uh, um, um, various partners uh, uh, to develop software which would um, uh, propose a hypothesis, say, of uh, regions which are ischemic. We looked actually into ischemia here and also leakages, so incompetent vessels and so on. Um, including the periphery is, uh, um, again, uh, something which uh, uh, impacts directly these ultra-wide field of view images uh, um, uh, of which this is another example. This image here suggests uh, some recent results we obtained uh, last summer. So we now have software which uh, largely automatically, with, but with some user intervention, generates uh, um, uh, segments out uh, a, a good part uh, of uh, the vasculature, but this time tracked uh, uh, into vascular trees. Uh, so that means that uh, the colors here are just there to indicate that uh, the trees have been separated. Um, uh, all of these uh, are classified uh, as vascular and, uh, uh, sorry, as uh, arterial and or, uh, or uh, venous trees. So once you have these, uh, we are rather excited because, uh, um, um, but first of all, this result does not grow on trees. Uh, it's not very common to find this in software. But more, more importantly, um, uh, you can take biomarkers uh, to the next level up. Uh, so instead of just looking in zone B, you can now take statistics, measurements uh, across whole trees. You can look at um, vessels uh, generation by generation, first, second, third, if you agree on a definition, of course. Um, um, so this is exciting for us, definitely. Um, uh, this is another image from uh, um, um, processing of an optos image. The circles are here. The circles um, are the standard uh, optic disk diameter by optic disk diameter um, uh, used on fundus images, uh, uh, as I showed before. But the circles are here to show how much far into the periphery you can go. So you've got about uh, uh, 200 plus degrees uh, horizontally. I mean, it's not a free lunch. There are some consequences which are not all positive. But, you know, you, you see a lot of the, of the retina. Okay. In an attempt uh, to um, uh, take this presentation a little bit closer to the optic disc uh, and, and glaucoma, um, I've included some recent, recent work uh, we are doing on uh, um, uh, detection of uh, the retinal nerve fiber layer as when visible in, uh, in fundus uh, images of suitable qualities, in particular in red-free images. So again, this is an automatic system that we are developing in the context of a project uh, about uh, um, multimodal retinal biomarkers for vascular dementia. Um, this is a collaboration between Dundee, Edinburgh, uh, the computational groups uh, and uh, the hospital groups, the Center for Brain, Clinical Brain Research and uh, um, uh, the FAR Institute um, in uh, Dundee and Edinburgh. The FAR Institute is uh, um, um, the UK is creation, if you like, outfit, which uh, uh, is tasked uh, with implementing the, the dream uh, of uh, giving every possible, eventually, every possible record, um, uh, clinical record, uh, from patient uh, to research, making it available under all the, of course, uh, constraint, uh, um, uh, necessary anonymization, and so on. Uh, needless to say that the computational, the health informatics effort required for an operation like that is, is, is colossal, clearly. So a work in progress. So in Dundee, we are lucky because we are rather ahead of the game. Anyway, within that project, we have a stream of work uh, detecting as many biomarkers, as many measures which could be candid biomarkers in the retina as possible. So we thought the retinal nerve fiber layer could be one. But I understand, 
um, uh, I understand, I'm not a clinician, that uh, defects of the retinal nerve fiber layer may be connected uh, with glaucoma in terms of being precursors. So I'll show you some of uh, what we've done here. So this is uh, um, uh, what a drawing of what the retinal nerve fiber layer outlay is. Uh, um, uh, and this is an example of a good image, red-free image, which shows uh, the striations uh, and the um, uh, higher intensity response of the part, at least, of the retinal nerve fiber layer, typically along the arcades. So um, um, sometimes there are defects, uh, which are observed uh, uh, at best, clearly, with OCT, because then you look across the retina, but um, uh, sometimes also in, in, uh, in fundus images, which are by far still the most common images available to research. This is our interest. So, um, so you see here, for instance, uh, um, uh, it's white, uh, white, uh, bright, bright, and all of a sudden there is this region of, uh, of dark. So that would count, I understand, as a potential defect to detect automatically for us. So here are some initial results, uh, uh, just to give you the feeling of uh, uh, what we do in this case. Um, uh, first of all, we collect, of course, uh, initial, in this case, uh, uh, sets of images from the hospital, typically, um, uh, and ask them to annotate the images. Um, uh, so in this case, uh, the annotation consists in a classification by a couple of experts uh, on, um, uh, or, or in these classes. So uh, we're just looking visibility, non-visibility in a fundus image for the moment. So these are numbers uh, of images in this, so good visibility, moderate visibility, poor visibility, and that would be our ground truth. Um, um, this was done prospectively, incidentally. Um, so what have we done? Um, uh, we've looked in this particular case uh, I'll descend into a modicum of details, uh, of computational details. Um, uh, we've developed, uh, um, uh, well, we've we ad adapted, to be honest, uh, a specific machine learning techniques called multiple instance learning, which uh, um, uh, tries to um, localize uh, targets uh, without uh, specific ground truth. So we did not ask the doctors to tell us, tell us where you can see in the image, uh, square by square, um, uh, the retina nerve fiber layer. Just tell us, uh, do you see or not, or don't you see in this image? So we have um, uh, image global label, image level uh, labels, and we want to reconstruct the positions of, of uh, uh, the retina nerve, if visible. So um, um, these are baseline methods, uh, support vector machines uh, and uh, uh, mill support vector machines, multiple instance level support vector machines uh, um, uh, for comparison. Uh, at the moment, we are close to 90% success on that set of images uh, with consensus ground truth from two experts, which is, is respectable because uh, the kind of uh, um, uh, representations we compute square by square at the moment is, is, is kind of standard and we haven't done anything particularly clever. So we're encouraged by that. Uh, eventually, this binary label, visible and not visible, will become within the larger project another column in a spreadsheet, essentially, with, with all the measurements, the features, which, which eventually will be evaluated as potential biomarkers for dementia. Okay. So these are just visual um, uh, examples of uh, what it means for us to detection. These are kind of likelihood maps uh, computed automatically. The redder, the better. So that the more red the, the region is, uh, the more the system believes uh, that uh, there is uh, the RNFL visible there. Um, uh, and these are all red free images uh, for illustration. There are correct predictions, uh, correct predictions for invisible. There are mistakes, of course, uh, clearly the nearly 20% plus of mistakes, which I'm not showing examples, not because I want to hide behind a finger, the, the, the system is not perfect, but because, uh, you know, at this level of description and uh, you can see the images very well, I'm very happy to later to show you also <laughs> the wrong uh, answer from the system. Okay. I don't really have conclusions because I just wanted to give you a very quick flash of some of the, um, uh, of the activities that we have. I'm not telling you about uh, a number of things like uh, uh, the specific projects on biomarkers we have, uh, parts and so on. But I wanted to show you this slide, which uh, um, uh, even in these 15 minutes uh, is only there, not to read the names, but to give you a, a flavor of the size of the operation. These are basically all the people we work with uh, uh, and have worked with recently within the last few five years, not more than that, and a little bit scattered around the world. 
Okay, so this is uh, uh, very, very quickly what Vampire is. Uh, we will be delighted to work uh, with uh, modeling people. We've started, of course, to work with uh, Giovanna. I hope uh, the, the pool will, uh, will get larger. Uh, the key word to remember, apart from vampire, which is easy to remember, um, um, is uh, quantitative um, um, quantitative uh, parameters extracted reliably, hopefully, and uh, consistently, certainly, from uh, different types of retinal images uh, for various purposes. Okay, that is our website. That is me, of course. Um, uh, this is where you can find uh, a list of our publications with PDFs. Uh, please take a look, uh, and uh, thank you very much again to the organizers for inviting me. Thank you. I think we are running out of time, so only a few quick questions, if somebody has in the audience. If not, oh, Giovanna. I said I was an outlier, so I don't expect many questions. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you, so you showed some images with uh, fluorescent, and I was just wondering if there is also the possibility of some dynamic uh, acquisition, like to have the idea of the velocity or the, you know, with which the fluorescent is going through the system to add some kind of, uh, I don't know, biophysics, let's say. So, um, uh, briefly, um, uh, the sequences we have um, uh, come from a small numbers of laboratories, um, uh, like say three laboratories, sorry, uh, clinics. Um, the protocols they use uh, um, uh, is uh, based on manual clicking and the technician who acquires these images um, uh, knows uh, only that uh, uh, the images have to be taken in clusters, in dense clusters, particularly at the beginning, so there is a known approximate time for um, the mean of contrast uh, to reach the retina. And then there's click, 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 sort of, you know, because they want to catch the time to peak. Um, uh, then there is another fixed time, uh, click, 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 uh, for a second peak. Uh, um, uh, and there are models uh, which interpolate, there are mathematical models uh, which express functions which interpolate uh, these uh, two things. Uh, uh, there are instruments which allow you to take uh, um, uh, it continues, uh, uh, but for smaller field of view images, I'm not sure how much they are used in clinics, honestly. You cannot, you, you cannot use a fundus camera because you blind, obviously, uh, a patient. So. I, I will only comment on that briefly. I mean, we've, uh, fluorescein angiography, um, you know, for the measurement of, of circulation, it's been, it's been there for a long time. It's been done on fluorescein and with ICG. We used to do with the Rodenstock system many years ago with confocal, micro, uh, confocal system. We used to uh, be able, with simultaneous injections of fluorescein and ICG, uh, separate the microcirculation that we see in the retina um, with fluorescein with the argon at 488 nanometer, and then we would switch to uh, near-infrared with ICG, and then we'd be able to flush the choroid, and, and we've, we've done that, we've done that with some collaboration in, in Aachen, we've developed some software that actually looks at that. The, the, the problem is that, um, or I should say it used to be a problem, but there's some, you know, today you can really tag and follow uh, the red blood cells, you can also as we'll hear next from Lucia, you can also actually look at the oximetry. The fluorescein by itself, hard to know if you're looking at rural formations of the red cells or the white cells as well. So um, as we moved into the era of metabolism and really getting to the step, next step of oximetry, um, it would be better to tag the, to know that you're looking at the red blood cells uh, themselves. But um, uh, I, I agree with Giovanna's comment. I think what will be helpful clinically will be able to, to follow this uh, over time as well. So, very nice work. Thank you. Luca? And please, Luca. Yes, I, I saw you, you showed an image of uh, the subbasal plexus of the cornea yes. with uh, confocal microscopy. Yes. Um, when you want to compare some data longitudinally in order to see if there is something going on, 
it's uh, there's a problem that you it's very hard to to be sure that you finish in the same in the same place because the magnitude is so so big that it's very hard to be there. Are you aware of a software that that can do it? No, I'm aware of software that uh, mosaics uh, multiple acquisitions of uh, um, uh, small regions of the corner so that you get uh, a field which is probably five to six times uh, uh, the diameter, so to speak, the size of, of the normal square you would image. Um, I'm not aware of any work uh, uh, of, of this nature with automatic analysis done uh, in uh, longitudinal cases. And thank you very much. So our next speaker is Lucia Caricina from Indiana University. It is my great pleasure to introduce Lucia. I have known her for several years, and it was my pleasure to see a young student grow up into real scientist. And she will talk about oximetry and math modeling. It's a really interesting topic. Yes. OK. Uh, thank you, Ingrida, and thank you for the, all the organizers for giving me uh, the opportunity of, of presenting my research. And um, so, what I will talk um, what I will talk today about is some mathematical modeling, uh, together with some clinical data, and we try to do some patient-specific simulation using the model. So, as we discussed. Uh, in this Congress, in this past day, glaucoma is a multifactorial disease and uh, intra elevated intraocular pressure is a well-established risk factor, but as we know, it's not the only one because there are all the normal tension glaucoma patients and they don't have elevated intraocular pressure. And so one possible uh, risk, ca risk factor that may play a role is ocular blood flow that is a uh, and uh, if, we, if we look from in the literature, we can see a lot of correlation that have been found between ocular blood flow changes and the progression of the disease and the glaucoma damage. But unfortunately, the mechanisms behind this correlation are not well known. And so uh, today, in this framework, we actually try to address a big open question in this field. That the question is if, if op ocular blood flow changes or core primary or secondary to the damage in glaucoma. And how we're going to try to assess this using a combination of a set of clinical data that our collaborator collected in Iceland and Belgium of oximetry. And we, we're going to combine those data with that we develop of the retina microcirculation that has a description of the oxygenation in the retina and of the autoregulation in the retina. And we're going to use the model to do some patient-specific interpretation of the clinical data. So first of all, the data that we start from are oximetry maps. So here you have some example. And so you have a map of the oxygen saturation in the retina. And so in, uh, in in red, you have higher values, and in green, you have lower values. And I show you an example of a healthy high and of a glaucoma high. So these are the data that we start from. And um, so uh, the, our collaborators already collected all this data in a group of healthy patient and glaucoma patient. They also divided the glaucoma patient between um, uh, mild glaucoma and advanced glaucoma, depending on the mean field effect. And so what they found, uh, starting from the oximetry uh, data, they found that there is an increase in oxygen saturation in the advanced glaucoma patient compared to the LT patient and also compared to the mild glaucoma patients. And so they, um, when they found this, they, pro they suggested that maybe this is actually saying that maybe there is a secondary implication because you have, uh, you have glaucoma, so you have loss of retinal ganglion cells. This means that you have less tissue to nourish, so you have less oxygen demand. And so at the end, you have more oxygen in the veins, so you have higher venous saturation. But as we know, this is still a big open question because, as I said at the beginning, we still want to know if the implication is primary or secondary. So that, what I explained to you was the secondary implication. The primary implication will be that is actually impaired oxygen uh, metabolism or impaired blood flow that is actually causing the... Um, the damage in the retinal ganglion cells and the glaucoma disease. And so the goal of, of this um, 
research that I will present to you today is to use a model to theoretically investigate what are the possible explanation of this increase of venous saturation that, that clinicians see in patients. And so we're going to do um, a, a theoretical investigation. So briefly, the model that I used, that actually um, Simone also presented uh, yesterday briefly, is a model of the retinal circulation. So we just focus on, on, on this part. So the out, uh, upstream of the central retinal artery and downstream of the central retinal vein. And uh, is a model that has been um, developed by our collaborator IUPUI, Dr. Arciero. And, um, in this model, we have we can model the autoregulation mechanism. So we already uh, said what autoregulation is, but it's the ability of the vessel to change the diameter, so to constrict or dilate, in order to maintain a relatively constant um, flow despite uh, changes in pressure. And so the we in our model we. Um, we included four different mechanisms. The first one is the biogenic one that is related to changes in pressure. The second one, the shear mechanism related to shear stress. The third one, the metabolic that is related to oxygen demand, so what I will be focusing on in the rest of the presentation. And the third one is the carbon dioxide uh, mechanism. So all these mechanisms uh, play a role in the, ten in the wall tension. The, wall, the tension of the vessel wall has two components, a passive one, a structural component, and the active one that depends on the, this, parameter, this uh, function A here that is a smooth muscle tone. And uh, the, the smooth muscle tone, the, what I will call activation, is actually related to a stimulus function that is a linear combination of the four mechanisms that I just said. So myogenic, shear stress, metabolic, and CO2. And um, in, so in, in the next slide, I will, we, will, we will also do some simulation where we assume that the autoregulation is impaired. So assuming a case of, of a patient of impairment autoregulation and um, and Arciero, uh, her role in, uh, in her paper, showed that the metabolic and the carbon dioxide mechanism, the mechanism looks like to be the most relevant in the retina autoregulation. So when we model impaired or autoregulation, we're going to switch those two mechanisms off. And uh, so as I said, I will be focusing on the metabolic mechanism because it's what we are interested on in this uh, research. And so for the oxygen delivery to the tissue, the main assumption is that we do have a croc cylinder type model. So we have a vessel that is running through a cylindrical region of tissue surrounding it, and each vessel, vessel nourish that specific area. And so we have a diffusion equation in the radial direction of the tissue. And this parameter M0 that is actually really important in this study is the tissue oxygen demand. And Q is the tissue oxygen consumption that, is, uh, that depends on the tissue oxygen demand and on the volume of the tissue surrounding each vessel. And another important parameter is the, this D that is actually the tissue width that can be changed. Concerning instead the oxygen transport in the network, we do have um, um, a conservation law where the changes of oxygen flux is equal to minus the tissue oxygen consumption. And so here you can see an example of one of the output of the model. So you have a distribution of, of oxygen saturation in the network. These are the five uh, compartments. You have large ar arterioles, small arterial, capillaries, small veins and large veins. And so this is uh, along the network where this distance is the distance along the network. So zero will be the outlet of the central retinal artery and this end point here will be the inlet of the central retinal vein. Okay, so theoretically, as I said at the beginning, we wanna try to see what, what 
can be the mechanism that the model predicts to cause the increase in venous saturation that the clinicians see. And so the model predicts that there can be three different explanations. So the first explanation that agrees with the suggestion of the clinician is that there could be a decrease in tissue oxygen demand. And so you can see this first uh, figure over here. So if we go from the blue to the red curve, we decrease oxygen demand, we have an increase of venous saturation. We see this increase for uh, for every simulated value of ocular perfusion pressure because we could change the value in the model. And uh, um, we can see actually that these increased changes with respect to the value of ocular perfusion pressure is not the same amount. And so this will be the first possible explanation. The second possible explanation is the impairment of blood flow autoregulation. So is we switch off the metabolic and the carbon dioxide mechanism. You can see that if we go from the blue to the black dashed curve, only now, only in the case of elevated ocular perfusion pressure, we do have an increase of venous saturation. The third possible explanation here in the third part of the figure is that if we decrease the tissue width, so the width of the tissue around each vessel, so now if we go from the blue to the green curve, we do have an increase in venous saturation, and this is for every value of ocular perfusion pressure. So now that we have the, um, the three possible explanations of the model, we wanted to try to do some patient-specific simulation and, and, and see what are the results of the model and what, uh, what we can deduce from those. And so uh, I just give you an idea of what are, what are the input of our model, right? So we have, we have patient-specific input, that is the intraocular pressure measured in each patient, the mean arterial pressure measured in each patient, and the arterial oxygen saturation taken from the oximetry map. And also, we have to give, we have to feed our model with other two inputs. There is the oxygen demand and the tissue depth. And as an output, we do have pressure distribution in the network, blood flow, and also oxygen saturation, as I show you at the beginning. So how do we do the patient-specific simulation? Because we don't, we don't know for each patient the value of oxygen demand and the value of tissue depth. So what we do is that for each patient, we fix the patient-specific parameters, and we vary either one, uh, uh, either M0 or the tissue depth, in, or, in order to, to meet, to yield the venous oxygen saturation that is measured by each patient. And so that, that is actually the output of our model over here, okay? And so this is the result that we obtain. So on the left, you see the clinical measurement. We divide the advanced, we just focus on the advanced glaucoma patient because it's where the clinician found the difference in the venous saturation. And we divide those between primary open angle glaucoma and normal tension glaucoma. So if you look at the Clinical measurements, you have a higher venous saturation in both, in both groups compared to the healthy. And uh, if you just look at the, at, the, at the venous saturation between the two groups, POEG and NTG, the clinician couldn't find any statistical difference between their behavior. So now, uh, if, we, if we look at the model prediction, uh, over here you see bars with average and standard deviation of the value of M0 in gray and the value of tissue width D in, um, in D of each uh, group. And so what we can see for the POEG patient, we can see that there is a decrease, um, the model predicts a decrease in oxygen demand and a slightly decrease of tissue depth. So this will be the first and the third uh, mechanism or possible explanation that I show you in the previous slide. But if we look at the NTG uh, patient, we can see uh, pre pretty much no difference. So the average value are really close to the healthy one. So this is actually suggesting that probably the first and the third mechanism are, not, are maybe less relevant in this specific uh, patients. But what we should look for is the third mechanism, the impaired autoregulation. So I want you to focus on, on this picture over here. And so you can see the blue line is the healthy uh, theoretical curve that fits the average 
and the standard deviation of the healthy population. And so in this case, we are able to fit the, the average of the advanced NTG patient using the same parameters of M0 and, and, and of D, of the healthy one, just switching autoregulation off. And so in conclusion, uh, this uh, patient-specific um, investigation of clinical data is suggesting us that maybe there is a, a difference in behavior between advanced POAG and NTG patient. And it's suggesting that maybe in the POAG, oxygen demand is more relevant, and maybe in the NTG, outregulation, it's a, a more relevant factor to explain the the increase in venous saturation measured. And so in conclusion, we hope to keep working on, on, on this project and keep working on the synergy between clinical data, uh, collecting more data of more advanced glaucoma patients, because unfortunately now the, the number that, that we studied on was really small, and then keep working on this data uh, together with the patient-specific um, mathematical prediction and together with statistical method in order to try to unveil the correlation between the factors and also try to elucidate the mechanism behind those correlations. So I just uh, acknowledge my collaborators and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lucia. It was really very nice and amazing how you quickly can find and modelize everything up to the either oxygen saturation or demand or so on. So please, who has questions, audience? Yes, please. <coughs> this M0, this is the con oxygen consumption in the tissue, right? Mm, oxygen demand, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that you could investigate that with, for instance, fluorescence lifetime or something like that? You would like to know what happens inside the cells. Wouldn't that be something to study in the future? For instance, if you could go and study the lifetime of NAD or NADPH, you could really get a, a hook on that parameter. It's not yeah. easy, but... That, that would be really interesting because what we were able to find the literature worth I don't know, some estimates, some average values of M0, and then they were also changing a lot between inner and outer retina, light and dark, and then, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, data on animals, but on human, it's, it's really hard to find. So if we could really have some idea of what it would be uh, a, a right range or right values of, or a value for each patient, that would be awesome, yeah? Yeah, you would have to do two photon uh, microscopy in order to get that resolution. But you cannot do that in people, not yet, but in animals. <laughs> okay, thank you. Anybody else? So, as we see, you will go on with your investigations, and probably not only in humans, but in animals as well. <laughs> and we'll hear about you more in the yeah. future. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. And now I have pleasure to invite Irena Simonini from Italy, Milan. She will be talking about patient-specific models of the human cornea. Uh, good morning to everybody. I'm Irena Simonini and uh, I'm a PhD student of Politecnico di Milano. Uh, really, today it's my last day of my PhD. And um, I'm going to talk about a uh, patient-specific model of the human cornea, so I'm not, uh, talk I'm not going to talk about uh, glaucoma precisely, but uh, I'm going to talk about the construction of the patient-specific geometry of the human cornea and some analysis and methods that uh, I think uh, it could be applied in pathological situation. So, we know that the cornea is the external lens of the eye, and so because it is the external lens, it is the lens that um, it is easier to modify and to touch it. And for this reason, the cornea plays a key role in vision, and its curvature is strictly related to how well the eye can focus on object close up and far away. Because when a ray of light enters the eye, it is refracted or bent by the anterior surface of the cornea. Our study in particular uh, addresses the refractive eye diseases, in particular the refractive disorder, also called corneal refractive errors, in which we can find, we know, the myopia in particular and astigmatism, which we have studied in uh, my work, in my thesis. 
And uh, uh, we have considered also the conelectasia that uh, is uh, a group of congenital dysfunction characterized by an alteration of the normal curvature of the cornea. In particular, one of the most frequent of these uh, pathology in this group uh, is the keratoconus, uh, which we know is a progressive disorder consisting in a non-inflammatory thinning of the corneal stroma. In particular, from a macroscopic co point of view, we have changes in shape and geometry, and so in particular in thickness and curvature, and uh, which leading to a um, um, conical shape uh, with respect to the normal quasi-spherical shape of the cornea. And from the microscopic point of view, we have structural changes and anomalies in the collagen fibril organization, which loses its original structure. 